uh, structured bindings demystified. So, hello and welcome to my talk about uh, structured binding demystified, or otherwise called uh, three things worth knowing about uh, structured bindings. Um, I work for KDAP. Um, we do Qt, OpenGL, and C++. So you're right here if you ever wondered what the real use case was for structured bindings, or what this decal type of unstructured binding ID was all about. That we, eh? Or how to implement the protocol in less lines of code than your actual class. And this talk will show you. So first of all, use cases. Consider this small example where we have a multi-map of books and uh, from author, mapping from author to books. So one author can write multiple books. And um, we want to iterate over all the books, or I want to output all the books that Scott Myers wrote. So we use equal range. We get a pair of iterators back, and we can iterate over it. And as you can see, um, for the value, we need to say first, and for the, uh, for the value, we need to say second, and for the key, we need to say first. It's not a really nice API. If you don't know the API, you have no chance of understanding what's going on. So with structured bindings, we can decompose the pair into named member aliases. And this looks like that. So instead of having the pair, we have first and last. So that's the usual names for, for iterator range. And inside the function, uh, inside the loop, we decompose the, the pair, that is the value type of the map, into author and book, our domain. Now, we use the word words for, from our domain. And then we can say author wrote book. Yes, cool. But do we need structured bindings to go there? If we could redo the standard map API and not be bound by backwards compatibility, we could do this. So equal range would return something that is iterable. So you could just plug it into the for loop directly. And then the value type of a pair would not be, uh, of, a, of a map would not be pair with first and last, but some type that has key and value members. And yes, it's not book and author, but key and value are, are speaking enough so that this um, is understood by everyone. And look, Ma, it does not use structured bindings. So you ask, are structured bindings more than a fix for legacy API? And unfortunately, the answer is currently no. They are scheduled to be used in pattern matching. And here's a list of um, papers about this. Uh, and especially 95, uh, P0095 shows how structured bindings may be used in, in to form patterns. And here's some backgrounds on tuples and pairs. They're basically there for, the, for when you download the slides. So decal type mystery. You have this code the beginning of our code. What is first? What does decal type of first return? In particular, is it a reference or not? Anyone know? Who's for reference? Who's for something else? And the rest <laughs> doesn't know. So it's not a reference. But Herb says so. I have read the paper, P144. It says there, auto reference. And for tuples, type reference, and for members of, uh, of an aggregate, there, reference. But it also says this does not imply an actual reference. So what's going on here? Is it a reference? Is it not? And the solution is that structured binding declarations declare identifiers for the sub-objects. You name the sub-objects of an object, and not the object anymore. This is something completely new. So before, if you had a return from a function, you called it in a named variable, and you named the object. And then you said dot first, dot second to go get to the sub-objects. And with structured bindings, you still catch the whole object, but you don't give it a name. What you give a name to is the sub-elements, the sub-objects. So, but these identifiers aware of that these are not RVOable objects. They are not the top-level objects that you can construct in the stack frame of the caller, which is what RVO is all about, return value optimization. So this line here, the last, always copies. It does not matter what one or two is, it always copies. It never um, uses RVO. And this is only a problem with structured bindings. So far, if you had written standard move, return standard move off, 
identifier client would have warned you that this pessimizes because you disable RVO. And if you used the old code, if you stored it in an auto P, then returning P first would have hinted you that you're returning a sub-object and you did not expect um, uh, RVO to kick in and you would have written the standard move around it yourself. So last point, the tuple protocol. So structured bindings use the tuple protocol to access members of custom struct, decomposable structs, as Andrew Sutton calls them. And this consists of three parts. The tuple size to get the number of elements so that the structured binding expression can verify that you supplied enough identifiers. Tuple element with an index to get the type for each of the elements and get with an index to get the value of each of them. So uh, if you want to play nice with C++17 uh, structured bindings, you will need to implement this for at least some of your classes. Still to go? So let's have an employee class, and for the purposes here, it suffices that we have two, uh, a name, uh, two members, a name, and the year of birth, and we want to implement a tuple protocol for that. So, but preferably, we want, don't want to go here. Right, for overloads, uh, lots of template metaprogramming, is there something easier? And most of the time, yes, there is. So, the tuple protocol. Here's our class. The first thing is to do, to specialize tuple size. That's simple, just inherit from integral constant, like that, two. The second step is tuple element. And here, again, you see, when you see examples, you see that they specialize based on the integer index. And then they say using type equals standard string, using type equals int. But you can just reuse tuple element for tuple. Right? Like that. So now get. Um, you can implement get as a member function or as a free function in T's namespace, and then it's found via argument-dependent lookup. As we have seen, you need four overloads. If you want to handle volatile, you need six. Mutable const times R value and L value. But these can often be generated from just one function template. Here's how. Don't try to understand, follow me. So we don't have a member function, we have a friend function. So we have a free function, but we make it a friend so we can access our member variables directly. What we want to use is we want to use forward to perfectly forward um, to transfer the R valueness of the argument to the R valueness of the return value. And to be able to do this, we need a forwarding reference, and for a forwarding reference, we need a, uh, we need a deduced context. And we do this by making our function no, not only dependent on i, templated on i, but also on something called e. Now we did too much. Now we expect everything accept everything. So we need to restrict it again to employees. So E might deduce, be deduced as const or non-const and as a reference or a value. So we need to decay E and then compare it to uh, employee. So and then we use const expert if to check the index. If it's zero, we return name. But again, for an R value, we need to return R value reference to the name. So we use decal type auto. And since we return always references, we say no except, they cannot throw. So, um, what you might not know is that a sub-object of an X value is an X value. So if I say standard forward and standard forward is a move here, then M name will be an X value, an expiring value, so an R value. If I put references around it, it will be an R value reference. So both of these things, the forward and the parenthesis together, make the function return an R value reference or an L value reference, a const or non-const to M name, and the same for year and birth. Yeah, and this is a general pattern. As soon as, as, you, as long as you don't need to calculate the result, but can hand out references. Um, and why else would you support the uh, tuple protocol? You can do this. And with that, I thank you.